Oof. You guys remember Mad Men? Did you guys ever watch Mad Men? Oh, vividly. Oh, I've seen an app or two. Don't think I've it's, actually made it to the end, though. Doesn't he, like, join an ashram or something like that or become a whoa, hippie? Whoa, 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 whoa. Spoilers. Is it, Spoilers. Hey, I, is, I think we've passed the statute of limitations for spoiling Mad Men. <laughs> hey, some people haven't had time yet, okay? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Like me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you guys know how I am. As soon as I figured out that... Uh, there weren't any monsters. There wasn't any time travel or anything supernatural. I just thought I'll ask. I'll ask someone else for the recap. Uh, and but, ben, but it was a it was a Bernays playground. Yeah, and Ben, the monster is capitalism. Everybody knows that. That's a good point. That's a fair point. Yeah this this episode is about advertising. It's about what's called neuromarketing. The idea that we can, through the arcane application of data, nudge a user's subconscious mind. Now, folks, we did this one. Uh, we did this one a long time ago, and it's weird to see that so much of the stuff we talk about is still in play today. But it's even stranger to see how much of it is increasingly openly applied to everything from, you know, like a new car to a soda or um, what are those pogo sticks, I guess? Are those making <laughs> yeah. a comeback? Yes. Remember, yeah, those, sure. remember those Nickelodeon moon boots that were like mm -hmm. bouncy boots? Mm -hmm. Those are cool. Um, and I'm just going to put this out there. We made a video series on this topic. And if you have not watched on youtube.com slash conspiracy stuff, a video called neuromarketing and you stop what you're doing, watch that video. This is one of my favorite things that, that we created back in the day. It only has 43,000 views, which is pretty low for our channel. It is one of the silliest and most wonderful things you'll ever see. I promise. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. No spoilers, but that one is worth your time. And the, uh, the folks who are listening have already seen that you guys, you folks know what we're talking about. Uh, but without further ado, uh, the dangerous, disturbing science of manipulating you into thinking you're making your own decisions. <laughs> From UFOs to ghosts and government cover-ups, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now, or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello everyone, my name is Matt. And I'm Ben. And this is Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. Matt, a uh, couple of questions for you All to right. start the show. One, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Okay? Well, I'm gonna answer. Okay. What was the last thing you bought? Uh, Beatles Rock Band for the 360. That was literally the last thing you bought today. Oh, no. The last thing I bought today was food. Okay. Something, but yes, something that is not was not marketed to me. Ah, okay. Okay. So you're sure it wasn't marketed to you? Ooh, you know what? Perhaps it was. There is a sign. Mm -hmm. There is a sign downstairs in our lobby that, yeah is promoting their food, I guess. Yeah, we have a place uh, downstairs in our building where all the podcasters have been at least once, uh, even the vegetarians and vegans in the crowd, uh, wherein they, they sell, you know, sandwiches mm -hmm. and wraps and yogurt and granola, and they have a salad bar and a hot bar. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you feel very, uh, very American and in poor health sometimes if you shop at the hot food bar because they charge by the pound. Yeah. Which is a, a a quick indicator of uh people who eat too much. And no offense to Carrie and the people that run it. Who uh, hopefully fantastic. they don't yeah, they're wonderful people. That's why I go there actually because and the, the food's people. pretty good. The food is great, but man, yeah, they charge more than uh let's say their competitors around the area. Right, but we're also paying for the convenience. Before we get too derailed, the reason I ask you, you already clocked it, Matt, is because it is strange and frightening how oblivious most people are to the, the, the sheer amount, the sheer magnitude of advertising that plagues us throughout a day. And maybe plague isn't a fair word. How about inundates? There you go. Our existence. Well, I think we have to become somewhat blind to some of it because literally wherever you look, there is some logo, there's something selling you something. Mm -hmm. And, oh, yeah. Well, 
Looking around this room, it's not so bad. It's mostly soundproofing and tiling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. look at those rocket speakers, though. Yeah, look at that Apple. Need sure mics. That Mac. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. A uh, couple that of That Dixie buttons. cup. Oh, no, they got us. So just in the space of looking around, we've already seen several logos. And if we count logos as advertisement, then we quickly realize that this stuff is everywhere. Uh, I guess the fancy word for it is ubiquitous. However... Oh, yeah. However, listeners, uh, you probably have already heard Matt and I, uh, talk about Edward Bernays and other, uh, other things in advertising. So you are already relatively aware. I would say they're relatively aware, right, Matt? Yeah, sure. And if you've ever listened to George Carlin or, sure. you know, a lot of these other comedians mm-hmm. or watched, uh, I don't know, anything on NPR's website or PBS with Bill Moyers, maybe you, know more about this than we do. But. Or maybe you have taken a survey somewhere at a mall or in a grocery store and it's hit you, oh, these people are taking the questions they're asking me and trying to build something that I will be much more likely to buy. But do you know how far this science has evolved in a very short span of time Uh we would like to today introduce you to the concept of neuromarketing. Neuromarketing. Uh, so Matt, lay it on me, man. I want some stone cold definition here. All right. Here we go. So this is the definition of neuromarketing. It's the process of researching the brain patterns of consumers to reveal their responses to a particular advertisement or a brand or product. And um, you use that to develop new advertising campaigns and branding techniques to better uh, influence the your consumers, the human beings. Yeah, weird, huh? So this means that they're using things like MRIs and CT scans, even measuring the amount of moisture or sweat your body emits. Uh, the people doing this who call themselves neuromarketers claim that they can interpret this data and interpret it in such a way that they are able to make predictions about what consumers should buy and what kind of products they want to see. Now, now, now here's the good thing and the yeah. bad thing. What's that? It's still debatable whether or not this is effective or whether it works or how effective it is. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, but, but it is kind of an emerging, um, science, I guess. Yeah. Um, we do know that there are, there are, there are several pieces of the puzzle here that we do know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We know that, for instance, uh, the brain unconsciously prepares your decision. So before you or I, Matt, or uh, you, listener, would consciously decide to go left or right somewhere, you know, so you're walking around a trash can or an obstacle or something, before you consciously realize that you're going to go right or you're going to go left, your brain has already made the decision. There's a bit of a lag time, like you're on a, a crappy computer connection or something. So uh, in 2008, some scientists in Germany published a study showing this, and here's what they did. Uh, they measured somebody using their left or right hand for a task, and they found that several seconds – before a human being consciously decides what they're going to do, the outcome can be predicted by looking at unconscious activity in the brain. So they have them wired up to an EEG, a real one, an academic lab level, yes. not the commercial stuff, as we'll find. And they saw that some part of their brain, a couple of seconds before they said left, some part of their brain spiked up and the decision was already made. Spooky stuff. That comes from an article in The Telegraph by Alex Hannaford. So so what happens uh, in, in our brains when we're watching a television commercial about a sad one about puppies and how they need oh, to be man. adopted? Uh, or, Sarah McLachlan. Yeah, huh? I mean, well, there there is something that happens. You you might tear up. You mm-hmm. might um, you might laugh hilarious. Something you just find so funny. Sure. Uh, maybe a beer commercial. So what's happening in our brains when when we're watching these things? Well, one thing's for certain there are, there are brain waves that are correlated to the these heightened uh, states of attention mm-hmm. and uh, kind of emotional reactions. So according to the researchers who are studying these EEGs, they're really saying that uh, when you're watching something that's compelling like this or causing an emotional response, uh, the the electrical responses in your brain are hyper focused on some of these areas, and then the other. Um, the other activity kind of subsides. Hmm. So you're, there's less thinking going on, less activity going on in other places besides 
that focused fear or um, uh, some finding something's funny or mm-hmm. romantic or whatever, whatever emotion they're going for. Ah, I see. So they're kind of hacking past the critical thinking aspect of the brain to see what triggers that immediate emotional response. So let's think of every advertisement, every logo as essentially a pitch or a proposition, right? Why you should buy this. If these pitches are going to succeed, then they have to reach that subconscious level of the brain where you develop initial interest in a product, the inclination to buy it, where you have that brand loyalty. At least that's according to a guy named A.K. Pradeep, the founder and chief executive of a company called NeuroFocus. Now, NeuroFocus being a neuromarketing firm, clearly has some bias. They're not going to, they're going to be the ones on the side of the argument that says neuromarketing does work. Well, sure. Cause that's their product, right? Their mm-hmm. brand. And that, to me that, okay, I just want to pause really fast. Yeah. That's a fascinating thing to me. And I'm, I know we're going to talk about it later, but that the idea of selling a brand is it's in their interest to sell their brand just as much as they are looking at how these other brands are selling their brand. And that will come into play later. Makes in you podcast. wonder. Yeah, it's a meta pitch for sure. So we know that uh, the NeuroFocus company has done marketing tests where they take volunteers, they give them an EEG sensor cap and an eye tracking device, and then just have them watch commercials or you know use the internet and visit a website or even watch a trailer. And the researchers are able to watch the volunteers' brain patterns and the um the eye movement so they know exactly what's firing when they look at this stuff um and you can you can go online and find videos and look at the brain patterns and eye movements for particular commercials there are several places if you just go to youtube and check out uh neuromarketing to do a search you'll be able to see exactly what the readout looks like for these scientists. Mm-hmm. And so people who believe that this does work say stuff very similar to what Dr. Pradeep said, which is by measuring brain waves, we're able to measure attention, emotion, and memory. So computing the subconscious response to stimuli um, got a little poetic at the end mm-hmm. here. If you add all these electric patterns together, you find it represents the whispers of your brain. Uh, I mean, yeah. Buy more soup. Man. Use the sodium in that soup. You can tell because it's on the label. <laughs> and this weird whispering thing we're doing is a true story. It's an introduction to one of our first examples of neuromarketing, which involves dun, 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 dun. Campbell's soup. Yep, true story, you guys. Uh, Campbell's soup. The company hired some researchers to study microscopic changes in skin moisture, heart rate and other stuff to see how consumers react to uh, everything from, like, pictures of bowls of soup to the design of the logo. And <laughs> this neuromarketing approach is kind of a fresh attempt among these consumer goods companies to to kind of understand how consumers really respond to their marketing and, you know, all the money that they're spending on marketing and advertising. Yeah, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster. Uh, there are people like Robert uh, Barocci from the Advertising Research Foundation who says that this allows us to build a bridge between the raw data of brain activity to uh, the generation of meaning, you know, so that we're able to somehow divine and interpret these signs. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, cause for years, uh, Campbell's was doing the same thing that everybody else was doing in the game. They would, you know, you go to a marketing research thing. I don't know if you ever did this little sidebar here. I have actually. Okay. Not with Campbell's in particular. Yeah. I've done this, not with Campbell's, but it's a great way to make a little extra cr- scratch on the side, you know? Mm-hmm. So I've done it for a number of things. Um, this market research stuff is something you can look into if you want a little extra sporadic money and they'll ask you some ridiculous questions. Anyway, I digress. Here's how it goes. They sit you down in a room. Matt, you know about this. They show you some things. They ask you some questions and then they also ask you how you feel about stuff. So Campbell's was doing this just like pretty much any other company under the sun. And they were showing people ads and saying, okay, would this ad make you more likely to buy soup? Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they realized, 
over time that even the ads that their marketing research folks told them were surefire, can't miss foolproof hits, uh, didn't really seem to affect sales one way or the other. You know, soup sales still went up in colder months, down in hotter months. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, Ben, the mm-hmm. thing I did that with was movie trailers. Ah. Where they would show you three different edits of a movie trailer and have you answer questions about each of them. Like, what do you think this, the plot of this movie is about? Who do you think the main characters are? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to watch this movie because you saw this person more? Hmm. It was, um, it's pretty horrifying that then that can, that marketing research becomes what a film that's, you know, yeah. either trying to make a statement or just making some money off the back of, <clears throat> in this case, uh, uh, let's, I don't want to, I want to see what movie it was. It was a bad, it was a terrible movie. Tell me what movie it was, please. It was The Love Guru. The Love Guru. Okay. With Mike Myers. Yes. Oh man. So you're responsible, huh? Uh, <laughs> no, partly. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> one thing, let, let's sidebar this for a second okay. again. Uh, one thing that gets me that I want to ask you about is, have you noticed the tendency of film trailers to become longer and longer and tell most of the story? It, it wanes, it waxes and wanes. Okay. And I would say it depends on the, how much control the director has. Cause the director doesn't want to give away all the secrets of the show. Yeah. The director wants you to come and watch his story mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe the writer or, uh, in some cases the producer, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, usually they want you to come and watch their whole story and they want to tease you to get there. I see. But the, the, the money guys just want to show you whatever is, whatever they have to show you to get you in that theater. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the things that I think separates neuromarketing from other conventional market research. Going back to our Campbell story, this guy, Robert Woodard, uh, he was Campbell's vice president of global consumer sales and customer insights. And he said that their regular interview style wasn't that useful because people weren't able to fully articulate their unconscious responses. So they needed, Campbell's being they, they needed to figure out the neurological and bodily underpinnings to an ad. They needed to see how people were unconsciously reacting rather than see how people thought they were reacting. Yeah, because you don't know, man. It's unconscious. So by 2008, Mr. Woodard, he settled on the biometric tools combined with a different type of deep interview. And I'd like to know more about that. Oh, I bet it was the Blade Runner questionnaire. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your address? What? Oh, I wish I could do that whole thing. I know the other guys here could do that. But yeah, he, they decided to use this deep interview to more accurately gauge which consumer communications worked best. So, um, Campbell's Campbell's then hired on Interscope Research Incorporated, which is a Boston company, and they do the same thing. They measure bodily responses, and uh, they also hired a couple other firms to help conduct this this kind of research where they're looking at, it's so weird to me, bodily responses to marketing. That suit makes people too sweaty. Put it in a blue can. (laughs) Uh, The, you know, I am... Joking around, I don't know if anybody did that, but the Campbell story is pretty fascinating and you can read about it more in depth in an excellent article by the New York Times and a few other publications. But I'd say try the Times first. And speaking of huge companies, uh, Campbell's is not the only company in the game, right? Oh no. Oh no. Frito Lay, uh, they'd been studying female brains to learn how to better appeal to women. And, uh, their findings show that the company could avoid pitches related to guilt. And guilt free and, uh, and instead play up healthy associations. Oh, like Fritos for your health. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Microsoft is looking at EEG data to understand how users interact with computers, specifically three feelings. This is so weird. Surprise, satisfaction, and frustration. I just don't understand. I, do, I uh. <laughs> I don't understand, Ben. All right, whatever. I'm satisfied by that. <laughs> but Microsoft isn't the only tech company getting into this racket. Oh, gosh. I, should That's I say fine. racket? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Google made some waves when it partnered up with this company called MediaVest. And they, they're they using biome- biometrics to study and measure the effectiveness of YouTube overlay ads as well as pre-roll ads and kind of what's the effectiveness with the pre-roll versus overlay. Well, oh, okay. here's the result. Huh. Overlays were much more effective on the subjects because 
Well, as you all know, what happens when you see a pre-roll ad? You wait for that five seconds to pass. And you click it as quickly as you can. Yeah. And that makes sense. I hope they didn't pay too much money for that. I know. Uh, we could have told them. Another company, Daimler, right? It might be familiar with people. If you've heard of Chrysler, Daimler, and Daimler Chrysler, uh, they employed fMRI research to inform a campaign featuring car headlights. And they found that it hits the reward center of the brain when the car's headlights help it look like a human face. Wow. That's how some people buy cars. I, yeah. I mean, how do you think, what is it, the bug? The bug was hugely popular back in the day. I bet that's why, Ben. And one more example, maybe before we go to commercial. Yes, Ben, the Weather Channel uses, and they used EEG, eye tracking, and skin response techniques to measure viewer reactions to three different promotional uh, pitches for this popular series they were putting on. And uh, I don't know exactly what they found, yeah. but just knowing that even the Weather Channel mm-hmm. is going, okay, this is a new thing. We need to get on this. Yeah. How, how do we, how do we bring, uh, sexy back to tornadoes? Yeah. I'm kidding. I <laughs> hope they don't talk that way. I hope they don't talk that way. Maybe it's a different show. We can dig in and get more information on that. But now we are going to take a brief break and we will return very soon after a word from our sponsor. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed. Our minds are molded. Our tastes formed. Our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. From Propaganda by Edward Bernays. To learn more about public relations, advertising, and the human brain, read Propaganda. This announcement paid for is a result of ongoing litigation on the part of Illumination Global Unlimited. This advertisement in no way reflects the personal opinion of Illumination Global Unlimited, its shareholders, corporate overlords, or secret society leaders. This advertisement is in no way a denial nor a confirmation of contact with extra-dimensional entities. This advertisement is in no way an admission of guilt nor a tacit implication that you are being controlled. This advertisement in no way relates to... From Saigon to Jakarta until the fire was contained. Illumination Global Unlimited. Turn on the light. All right, Ben, we're back. Um, that one, that was a interesting outro there. Seems yeah. like some serious litigation going on with our sponsor. I mean, I guess they're just now required to tell people about Propaganda by Edward Bernays, which is a good book. We've recommended it. Did you? Did you notice that part at the end where they were talking about extra dimensional entities? I'm just glad we have a sponsor, man. Don't dig too deep. Okay. All right. I guess you're right. The money's good. So. Oh, are you getting paid? Well, I mean, our show's still on. I sleep in my car, man. Well, yeah, we both sleep in our cars, but the lights are on in the studio and the mics are working. Yeah. Yeah. But speaking of working, there's a big question about neuromarketing, and that is this. Does it work? Does it work? Mm -hmm. Skeptics aren't convinced that there's any proven correlation between brain activity and ultimate predictions of what someone will buy. So just because some part of your brain is lighting up, as seen by an EEG, doesn't mean that we have solved the secret of what makes people buy Raisin Bran, for instance. Speaking of EEGs, remember we were talking about earlier how those researchers were using the legit EEGs, or Mm -hmm. at least the ones we were speaking of earlier. Well, EEGs can vary. Uh, uh, widely in their effectiveness because there are, you know, like any product, you can get the top of the line Jaguar mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe someone's rolling around. I don't want to use another, uh, car oh, I know, like the Geo Metro of EEGs. <laughs> okay. There you go. There's the Geo Metro of EEGs and it can just, it's just not as good, unfortunately. And another thing that we need to remember is that 
EEGs need to be applied by professionals who know what they're doing. Yeah. And there's a reason that in an actual study, you know, in like a medical study or a clinical psychology study, the people applying the EEG spend a long time putting them on correctly. So there's also a question of how how high quality or low quality the data is. You yeah, know? you have, that's something you have to be trained for a long time on how to do it effectively. Because really, you're just getting numbers, outputs, and graphs, and yeah, if you don't know how to do that, ugh. and for the the companies that are doing this, the private companies, whatever you do or don't think about them, uh, we know that their primary selling point is their methods of interpretation. That's what differentiates them from one another. That's what lets company A get better results than company B, right? Supposedly, yeah. Here's the data we collected it scientifically. And, uh, enjoy. It's, it's real. Until you ask, hey, how does that work? Because that is one of the most difficult things for skeptics about neuromarketing, which is that the companies are required to keep their methods secret. You know, kind of like a trade secret, the way that Coca-Cola's actual recipe is still a big secret. So they can't reveal their methods, which means there's no way for somebody to independently verify the results, which means that we can't really know because reproducing result is part of what makes something real science. Yeah, that's how you test the scientific mm -hmm. method. Well, okay, Ben. Now, let's really, let's really get down to brass tacks here. Okay, brass tacking. What does all of this mean? The studying of our brains to even further mm -hmm. com, uh, convince us that we need to buy products. What what is neuromarketing? What's it going to do overall to mm. advertising and marketing? Ah, okay. Uh, do you want to pro con this? I do. Okay, uh, Noel. If we could have some utopian music. Okay, so one of the first things is that there will be better advertising. You won't see as many ads that don't apply to you. Guys, your days of sitting through ads for feminine hygiene products are probably over. And Unless your your female partner, mother, whoever it is, is sitting next to you. Ah, uh, yeah, but then it's kind of aimed at them. So there will be better advertising. Uh, there will be this use of predictive data, and it'll also be easier to learn about things you might enjoy. So if you... Like, uh, if you like a film or you would like a film or a book that you would not ordinarily have heard of, then having this data will enable these companies to tell you about this amazing thing that you miss. I want to jump on this point really fast, this utopian thing. I think this might be something that we have to go towards because there is so much media being generated. There are so many products being created. If we, the specialization is at the point now where if we don't get targeted mm -hmm. by these things, we will just, like you said, we'll be inundated even further by just products being thrown at us and films being mm -hmm. shown and television shows and YouTube shows. That's a really good point, Matt. And I'm glad you say it because something interesting, this is not completely related to neuromarketing, but something interesting about this is that you know, in the days of old, before information was so cheap to move around the world, uh, the way that people kept a secret was by reducing the amount of content in a field. So you wanted something secret, you lock the file away, right? And you don't tell anybody, maybe you kill somebody if they know about it. And now that switch is flipped. Now, instead of slowing things down to a trickle or even stopping the trickle, We've opened the floodgates. Yeah. And it turns out that in some ways it's equally difficult to find the needle in the haystack, um, than it is, you know, as opposed to searching in, in the dark for something that doesn't exist. Oh. So, uh, now I think it's time for some dystopian music, right? <laughs> Uh, what's the bad side? All right, here's the dystopian angle, everybody. So constant advertising and predictive data and lack of privacy, uninformed consumers, possible predictive mistakes. How does this interact with other predictive data that's being collected about you right now? And what are the applications? 
outside of the ad world. Oh, I can tell you. What? War. War? Yeah, yeah. Remember in our stuff on Edward Bernays, we explored how he used the same advertising techniques that made bacon a breakfast food, true story, made women smoke Lucky Strikes, true story, and then he transferred those skills to win support for an invasion of Guatemala. Okay, we talked about this before, and I don't want to belabor the point too much, but uh, the United States didn't really have a compelling interest to go into Guatemala for the good of either Guatemala citizens or the average Jane and Joe public in the United States. It was for the advantage of uh, the United Fruit Company, and he was able to convince people using these marketing techniques that this was a stand against, um, what was it? What was the boogeyman at the time? Communism? It's usually the boogeyman. I can't recall. Yeah, I believe it was communism. 1954, this invasion happened because a very convincing ad man was on it. So with the use of neuromarketing, it may be possible to hack somebody's brain, tap directly into the ideas of fear and anger, and boom, got another war. When see it's oh man, I complete I completely see where you're going there. It's just so tough. I I I, I don't know unless they're really good. I don't know how they're going to mm-hmm. convince people our age and younger than us mm-hmm. that war is still the way to go. I feel like we've become we're becoming much more and more skeptical of mm-hmm. uh, the warring nature of. Uh, at least our country, in the United States. Right. Well, people may be more cynical, for sure. Uh, also, there might be a little bit of fatigue amid the people who would ordinarily go to war. Mm-hmm. Um, the people who would actually serve in the military uh, may feel that they, they've they been betrayed in some ways by the leadership but also uh, people may feel that it is their duty regardless. You know, I can't remember the old, the old poem, uh, ours is not to reason why ours is but to do and die. Um, it's pretty, pretty bleak. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the poem, but I do remember that line sticking with me. So I guess it just depends, Ben, on how well this stuff works. And if, if they can convince me mm-hmm. that we need to go to war, then it's working. Hmm. Okay, yeah. And I'll report back. I'll let you know. You're not a, a big fan of Warren, who is? Well, yeah, I'm, there aren't a lot of people that are, but I think uh, especially you and I, after mm-hmm. digging into so much of this information, you just start to realize the the external reasons for war, and it's not the ones that they're telling you. Yeah, historically, the reasons that a, a group of people are told to go to war by their leaders are often not entirely the the i'm not saying they're untrue but they're not the entire truth uh there's another thing we should talk about here which would be possible mistakes predictive mistakes so we know that in neuromarketing again if this actually works they'll be able to market toward people based on their past uh data so everything from your facebook likes to where your phone goes via gps Plus, uh, what parts of your brain fire when you see, you know, an Xbox? And here's where it gets strange. What, what if they get it wrong? You know, what happens if there's some faulty gear or maybe when they read your data, you're having an off day, then you just spend your time doing what? Like constantly being bombarded by, you know, let's say you're hungover. When you somehow get your data entered, mm-hmm. then for what? What happens then? Do you just for the rest of your time you get bombarded by ibuprofen ads or whatever? Here, here's the messed up thing. It's probably um, I'm assuming that it's once it comes into full swing and your television or your Xbox or your PS4 is monitoring you uh, at all times when you're sitting in front of your screen. Uh, I see. It's going to see that one day as possibly an anomaly mm-hmm. and but it will still take I'm assuming this is messed up but I'm, I'm assuming it'll still take that into consideration that this guy gets drunk 
maybe on this certain day, maybe uh, depending yeah. on the frequency. So okay. yeah, maybe Advil is something that this person so needs. It's Saturday night, we'll advertise some sort of beer, and Sunday morning, we'll advertise ibuprofen. So it's uh, it's, huh. and if you look out in the future, you can really see. I don't know that dystopian view uh, hits home with me. Here's a here's another concern about neuromarketing. Um, the idea that this would be continual monitoring, which you do bring up, continual biometric monitoring, which could happen is a ways away for now, but it'll probably happen in our lifetimes. It'll at least be possible uh, for large groups of people to be followed that way. But one other question that I have here is, is how predictive can this data be? To what degree does it predict? And what, if any, uh, legal rights or uh, do do average consumers have? Because here's one of the worst things if we're going for the dystopian view, and that is that with neuromarketing, if somebody has found the silver bullet, then what they're doing is taking advantage of people without their knowledge and without their consent. Um, my next question then, going back to the predictive data idea, is, you know, uh, how does this – how does this coalesce with uh, privacy or with other things? Like there was a rumor for a while and a, and a worry that I think is well-founded uh, when people who were on Facebook said, you know, what happens if Facebook works with credit reporting agencies and then gives me a score of some sort based on not my credit score, but the aggregate of the people who know me? Ooh. And does that and and could that make uh, the banks in turn decide to uh, give me a lower or a higher interest rate? Could it affect my insurance? That's interesting. So looking at the your closest associates to see how to judge you. Yeah, building a network. You know. Ooh. When I first found out about it, I went through. Um, when I saw that Facebook account, I went through and liked a bunch of in investment banks <laughs> and, you know, uh, wealth equity management yeah. stuff, uh, and, uh, high end cars. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, changed all my movies over to wall street movies. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's a great idea. And the only, the only groups I like are humanitarian. Right. We have one other thing to do before we get out of here, uh, and that is to issue a correction. The uh, resort we talked about in our podcast on deep underground military bases, we said it was in Virginia. That is incorrect. It is in West Virginia. And uh, no offense to the people of Virginia or the people of West Virginia. And thank you to the great folks who wrote in to let us know about that correction. Yeah, if you ever hear anything like that, um, that we got wrong, just let us know. We're not perfect, but we try to be. Yeah, and I had a couple of shout-outs that we're supposed to give, uh, but I'm going to hold those over for the next day because I think we're, we're pretty good on our time here, Matt. Yeah, so, so what we're going to do is send it to you guys. What do you think? What's the solution to neuromarketing? Is it okay? Are you all right with it? Uh, do you want to have your advertising more targeted towards you? Is that a good thing? Or should we all just turn off our TVs and get rid of the Internet and go outside and plant an, an orange tree? I, I don't know. I don't have the answers, but I want to hear what you think. So write to us on Facebook. Uh, we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Twitter, we are at Conspiracy Stuff. You can find and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.